I'm here today with Michelle Sanchez, who serves as Executive Minister of Make and Deepen Disciples for the Evangelical Covenant Church. Michelle is the author of three new books that all just released, Color Courageous Discipleship, Color Courageous Discipleship Student Edition, and the picture book, God's Beloved Community. After studying international business at New York University, Michelle worked as an investment banker with Golden Sachs and ministered to international students with Crew. She served in various capacities with the Institute for Bible Reading and the Lausanne Movement for World Evan Evangelization. <laughs> Sorry. She's a frequent conference speaker and a regular columnist for Outreach Magazine, and you can learn more at michelletsanchez.com. So, Michelle, uh, thanks for joining us, and congratulations on all of your great work. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I've followed your work for some time, and it's been a blessing to me. Well, thank you. Um, it's been a blessing to me to be able to do this stuff. Um, but I, I have to say, um, I've done hundreds, literally hundreds of interviews with authors releasing new books. Yeah. This is the first time, without a doubt, that I've interviewed someone who has three books coming out simultaneously. So, wow. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. And I recognize it is unusual. And in a way, I didn't come up with the idea <laughs> at first. You know, in the beginning, I had a book idea for adults. Uh, but in the process, I realized, wow, you know, the best way to do discipleship is all together in community as a family. So um, if there's any way that I could offer something also for young people, youth and children, I really wanted to do that. And plus, in my current role where I lead discipleship for the covenant denomination, I also oversee all of the generational discipleship ministries, including youth and kids. So I'm constantly thinking about all ages and, you know, the publisher was crazy enough to get excited about it with me. So we got three books. Well, that's a testament. I mean, <laughs> the confidence, you know, in, in you uh, by putting their weight behind three different books. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But maybe, could you tell us um, about something else that you'd like people to know about you? Something that else I'd like people to know. Yes, basically that I am a discipleship person. I am a discipleship person. Here's what I mean by that. If you would have told me five years ago, hey, uh, Michelle, you know, your first book that you're going to write is going to be about racial reconciliation. I would never have believed you in a million years, you know? <laughs> For me, uh, that's kind of always fallen in a different department. And literally within the Covenant Church, you know, um, I'm the discipleship department and there is another department, the justice department, that deals with racial reconciliation. So, um, you know, I, I am passionate about discipleship. What that's meant for me is, you know, I'm a trained spiritual director. I love introducing people to Jesus, evangelism. I love helping people grow and become more like Christ, all things spiritual formation. So that's been my sweet spot. Um, and that is also the angle at which I come at the race conversation. And I think what makes it a unique and needed perspective. Hmm. Hmm. So there's one area about your background I have to ask you about. Um, you know, I come from high tech and there aren't very many people like that are playing around in the Christian publishing arena that come from high tech. You come from investment banking. And I know there's not very many people in the Christian <laughs> publishing industry that come from there either. So tell us about how you decided and how you made that transition. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know how long you have. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's another thing I would say. Uh, I never had any plans of going into ministry at all. I mean, to, it is a shock that I am doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> Growing up, my family didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, I was a believer, but I was like, I want to get into a different financial position with my life and I will give and support the church and do all those great things. <laughs> but I need to make some money. And so I was excited to major in business in school. I was the president of the entrepreneurship club. You know, <laughs> I got into high finance and I was on my way to become a CEO or some such thing. Um, so that was plan A all the way. <laughs> and gosh, um, 
So let me just say this. My second day at work was 9-11. Mm. Wow. That was my second day York. at work in New, in New York. York City. Yeah, jeez. Right there in the vicinity. <sighs> and so a um, couple things about th- that. Uh, the previous month in oh, August uh, 2001, all of my training was at the World Trade Center on the top floor. Oh my goodness. Wow. I understand this. So if it was yeah. if it was oh, August geez. that this thing uh, happened, August 11th, I wouldn't be here. Um, but all the training on the top floor of the World Trade Center, I was there oh. every single day, all of August. And then we transitioned down the street to the Goldman Sachs building when we started. But oh. my second day actually on the floor um, getting started was 9-11. And so... Um, that day, as it did for many people, transformed so much, you know, I didn't immediately consider some kind of a career change, but essentially that day, as I was, you know, contemplating possible death or illness, the the air was just completely choked up with poison, Mm -hmm. um, walking home in my bare feet and my business suit, you know, um, over the Brooklyn bridge and the cities and flames behind me, people are panicking. It was like, why am I doing what I'm doing again? Like, uh, uh. just, you know, and like, if this is it, right. If I'm just done today, like, but why am I in this moment doing what I'm doing? And I, I didn't have a great answer for that. Right. Other than I just want to make some money. I didn't even like what I was doing very much. Um, and so the Lord just put that in my my heart. It was a seed, obviously, you know, deeply planted that day of like, something feels off with my life right now. Like I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And I always like to make it crystal clear to people. I met plenty of God honoring, wonderful Christian people in finance. Believe it or not, I did. No, I do. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, they, uh, many of them also had a sense that, you know, that's where they were supposed to be. And I knew in my heart and soul, it wasn't where I was supposed to be. So it was a couple of years. I had a two-year contract and I worked through that and I finished my time. But at the end, the Lord made it really clear that he had something else for me. I went from uh, Goldman Sachs, listen to this. I went from Goldman Sachs to Crew, Campus Crusade yeah. for Christ. Yeah. I went from making money to asking for money. (laughs) You have no idea the reactions this got. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, goodness. My colleagues thought I was insane. And in many ways, I guess I was. (laughs) But that started um, the path into ministry. And, you know, the rest is history. That's just so amazing, Michelle. Wow. (laughs) Good for you, right? I mean, for listening to the call. Amen. It's that's a big deal. God. That's a big yeah. deal. A change like that, like what you made. Yeah, it is. All right. So we got to talk about these books. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take them yeah. one at a time if we could. Um, you know, Color Courageous Discipleship. Mm-hmm. Is that where it started? It sounds yes. like. Okay. Yes. So can you tell us about what motivated you to write that book? Absolutely. So at its heart, What this book is about is making clear connections between race and discipleship, between following Jesus and dismantling racism. My, you know, dream would be that this was a natural connection, (laughs) but reality is it's not. And it wasn't for me either until just recently. Um, I've been a discipleship leader for years now, yet I wasn't making those clear connections. I thought about race, anti-racism, racial reconciliation. Oh yeah, those are the justice department, right? (laughs) But here's the thing, you know, in, in 2020, I started asking a lot of new questions. What is the connection between discipleship, spiritual formation, and race? I love things like helping people read the Bible better, um, teaching them to do a daily quiet time, you know, giving at church, worship, all of those traditional discipleship topics. But in 2020, as we were going through racial reckoning, it started to feel very irrelevant. And what's more, why do we still experience so much racial inequity 
in places where there are supposedly a lot of Christian disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's wrong with the way we're doing discipleship, right? So I was really pulled in to that question um, and have just come to understand there is a hole in the way that we do our discipleship. Typically, our approach has been colorblind, essentially. It's a colorblind approach. We, we kind of pursue all our spiritual practices and our relationship with Jesus. Like, you know, it's separate from any questions of race or ethnicity. But the reality is, no, <laughs> um, actually, it never was meant to be that way. Now, racism is about uh, a ju justice. It is a justice issue. But I think even more fundamentally, it's a discipleship issue. And if we can make that connection, perhaps we would make a lot more progress. Hmm. So, um, so that's the book for adults. Yes. The second one for students and the third one is a picture book, right? So three yes. age ranges basically yes. is the target for this. So yes. whose idea was that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this, you know, these three books, of course, um, can be purchased and used by any, anyone, individuals, um, but I really had communities in mind when I was writing this. What I had in mind was the pastor who's like, man, it'd be great if I could shepherd my whole congregation at once through some of these themes. Um, if I can disciple them around race and ethnicity and racial reconciliation together. Um, very often, discipleship efforts are split up and not connected and I think that especially with regard to this conversation, it's not a, it's not a wise thing. <laughs> um, it's not a wise thing. We, we need to kind of invite people all at once to the extent that we can. Right. And so, um, so that's that in that way, it was my idea to, to say, why don't we think about serving whole communities and especially pastors. And as I said, um, this is actually something that I'm excited about, that by January, there also will be a number of supplementary discipleship tools available, like um, teaching outlines you could use for sermons. There will be PowerPoint slides. Um, there's going to be a children's activity kit. You know, you could use that in Sunday school, like all of these things. Again, because my brain is always thinking discipleship and how can we form like people and whole communities and whole families? That's my job. That's what I do all day. And I know People need help. It's, it's one thing to say, you really should do this. You know, <laughs> it's another to say, and here's a whole, you know, suite of tools that you can use to do it. So anyway, yeah. So that's just a little, little picture of it. Now they each also have their own flavor. Um, the, the student edition of Color Courageous Discipleship, in fact, may be um, most appealing for many adults <laughs> because it's uh it's more condensed it's shorter <laughs> okay it's shorter it's got a lot more humor oh really uh-huh and it's got a lot more illustrations mm. so mm. both books have illustrations um pictures i mean graphics but the student edition has more you know just in okay. the, trying to keep young people engaged um it has a few supplementary things like um, a note for parents and and such so that's the student edition. And then the picture book, oh my goodness, I had the most fun writing the picture book. And I tell people, look, if you want a, a cliff notes of my book, just read the picture book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's called uh, God's Beloved Community. <clears throat> now, let me back up and just say that for Color Courageous Discipleship, the subtitle is Follow Jesus, Dismantle Racism, and Build Beloved Community. Okay. So the ultimate goal is that we are going to build beloved community together, right? And so the children's book just dives right into that. And it explores how Martin Luther King, um, of course, was a civil rights activist. There's so much we appreciate about him. It opens up with a little girl in school around Martin Luther King Day, and she's learning about civil rights. And then it switches, and she says, yeah, but when I went to church, mm. I learned that Pastor King had an even bigger dream, and that was beloved community, <laughs> right? And it's based on the love of God. And so it goes into the faith basis mm. for mm. beloved community, a community of equality and diversity and love of God. And so, yeah, all three um, – have brought me a lot of joy. So let's talk about how this came about with the publishing company. Yes. I mean, how did they 
kind of handle this threesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, the, yeah, they, um, that's the publisher is Waterbrook, um, imprint of Penguin Random House. And I just give them a ton of props, by the way, I have loved working with their team, fantastic people. And they understood what I was trying to do right away. Mm. Um, so in terms of the adult book, um, yeah, it, they were excited about that from the beginning. And so then the question is, what about the other two? Right. And, and how did those come about? Um, you know, I think, you know, so my agent, um, Don Gates, my agent, actually first said, hey, you know, student editions have been growing in popularity. So there's many books uh, now that there is a student edition for. Often um, a publisher will wait until the adult book has proven to be, you know, a success. And then they throw in a student edition, which is what I would have expected. Mm -hmm. um, but because of my role, because, um, you know, basically my day-to-day -day job, I am um, helping to equip whole churches and, you know, in a whole denomination, it was like, well, but it could be more powerful, right. To say, we've got it all for you ready right yes. now. Yes. Now, because of that though, it did take longer. <laughs> my, my publishing timeline took longer than I think. Well, that would make sense. Whatever, yeah. Whatever. The average three of them. <laughs> yes. There's well, a my, lot of moving parts, right? That's true. <laughs> and, and picture books um, <laughs> take longer yeah, always. Illustrations, right? got the illustration piece and the printing of color and all of that just takes a lot longer. So it yeah. slowed it down, but I think it was the right decision. And um, as far as the picture book, that was a hundred percent me, my idea, and, and I, because I have always wanted to write a children's book. If you look around my house, there's children's books displayed everywhere. I will go to the children's section at the library just for me um, because I love it. And I love how with children's books, you have to be you have to use words very powerfully. You have very few <laughs> words that you can use, right? So it's got to be compact. It's got to be engaging, you know, and um, it's got to be poetic, you know, and, and I love poetry too. So uh, they took a complete gamble on me. I will say <laughs> that this is not the way it typically goes. Typically for children's books, you know, yeah. you have your manuscript, you submit it and they say, yeah, you're nay. Um, but for me, I was like, I, I would really love to work on this. And they said, okay. So they said, okay, to a children's book before I had even any sense of what it would be called or what it would be mm. like. So mm. wow. I call that confidence in me and their own team to make yeah. sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to make sure. So I have to ask you about that because I mean, I know some of these folks, Bumi Ashola and Sarah Rubin yes. you know, are both friends. I know Bumi, who was the other one you mentioned? Conferences. Yeah. So did, did you work with one of them or both of them? Who, you said Boomi and who was the other one? Sarah Rubio. Yes. So they were, yep, there were the two that I worked on throughout the entire project. Sarah Rubio wow. and Boomi Ashola. Awesome. Awesome. They're awesome people. Women. That's great. Yeah. And so um, they, they did so much to help me learn the lay of the land. Right. And by the way, I did get some of that by attending the children's <laughs> conference that you put on. Remind me what it's called. Just a writing for your life, Christian children's book. Christian children's. Yeah. I attended that. That was so inspirational. Gave me some basics. Um, but, but then Abumi and Sarah really helped me in terms of things like, you know, cause of the book in the book, I rhyme. Okay. And at the beginning it was like, Oh, rhyming, you know, it's tough. It's to tough to do rhyming well. And I right. understood that. And I said, but I really <laughs> want to try when I read to my little girl, like, the rhyming books keep her so much more than the ones that don't. And so let's work on this together. And they did. And, you know, we're really happy with the outcome. Very cool. W what was it like, like adjusting your words, you know, for three different <laughs> age ranges? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Exhausting. <laughs> oh, um, so you know what? I, I'll just say, it was actually amazing because I had to, I, I feel like at this point um, I'm able to speak and communicate quite articulately about all of it, be, about color courageous discipleship, because I was forced to simplify it. I was forced to condense it. I was forced to say, okay, how can you make this idea interesting to a teenager? And I have a preteen and I know how hard that is. Right. 
So most of the time, you know, a, a adult authors are writing books for adults and, ah, you know, you, you write it and hopefully it's interesting, but it is a whole other exercise to say, what could hold the attention of my preteen and my nine-year-old daughter for the picture book? So, um, I think it actually, it made me sharper. Um, and you know, again, like I said, by the time I finished them, I said, Oh, some people are going to like these more because, um, they, they were hard work <laughs> to make more engaging and interesting for young people. I mean, it's the same kind of thing when I work with authors on their elevator pitch, I ask them to write a 50 word version because I know that that's really, really yes. Good, yes. right. To do it in a small number of words. And you're saying the same thing. I can totally believe that, you know, when you words are at a premium, um, you really have to pick them carefully to be clear and concise and to the point. Yep, exactly. And I would say too, for the, for the children's book, that was especially interesting because I essentially had to say, I've got, you know, 20 pages or whatever to explain one idea, like the, the core of what I'm trying to get at. And so it forced me to say, what is that? You know? And yeah, that the concept of beloved community, I realized that's, that's the heart of it. And so it also helps me to make sure I share that heart in whatever place I'm at. So good for you. Good for you. So <clears throat> you um, have been a black woman navigating predominantly white spaces um, most of your life <laughs> from what you, you know, you just, yes. how does that, <clears throat> excuse me, influence your perspective on this work? Okay. So I believe that it has helped me to understand the more subtle ways that racism plays out today. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So I grew up in a middle-class suburb of New York, and I had a great experience in a predominantly white community. The, the way that I ended up there, by the way, my parents are from the South Bronx. They grew up across the street from each other. And um, at a certain point, they got married and got to participate in like a low income housing program. So they were able to move out to Long Island, this predominantly white place, right? And suddenly I was in a school district that had a ton of resources and opportunities, things that they did not have. Um, I can't, and it was great. I can't remember any like overt acts of racism at all. I did well. I graduated as the first black valedictorian of my high school and I had many opportunities, you know, that opened up to me. Now, this is not to say I never ever experienced racism or exclusion, etc. Certainly it was there. I'm familiar with it, but not enough that I would say, oh my goodness, it was a huge problem, you know, that impacted my life. So, but here's the thing then, um, these days, we have a country where you can have a black president of the United States, <laughs> right? But at the same time, you have Ferguson. That contrast, my goodness, points to a level of complexity that is very difficult to grapple with, even for people of color like myself. So what I have um, come to see my experience as a Black woman in America um, has been exceptional, meaning it's an exception to the rule. <laughs> so I personally, because of some special opportunities, was able to escape the worst aspects of systemic racism. But there's still a rule, like there's still massive racial inequity in pretty much every category that we can measure wealth, employment, education, criminal justice, healthcare. I mean, all of these areas, right? And I, I can tell you, um, one of the first times I really started to um, awaken to this was when I was at Goldman Sachs, okay? So everything has been going to plan. I'm at this prestigious investment bank and they had a volunteer program. And I said, oh, great, I'll take a day off. I'll go volunteer. And um, I signed up to teach like, finance at an inner city school, personal finance or something, right? So um, I'm, I'm on my way to the inner city school and I'm thinking this is going to be great. I'm, I'm picturing them as little versions of me and just, you know, inspire these kids that they can do anything. Well, I get there. And of course, it's a mostly black and brown school. Walk in and I could not believe the state of the school. I could not believe that I was still in the United States The with the facilities just utterly dilapidated, their supplies completely inadequate. Um, kids were like 
sitting in the in the hallway at their desks trying to like hear me from inside the classroom like that it, it was way overpacked you couldn't hear anything i mean i was absolutely shocked at the conditions of this school i couldn't believe it and and for the first time i thought oh my gosh like if i had grown up in this school i i'm not sure what my life would be like i i these kids are not getting an equal opportunity in terms of education at all. I'd want to just get out of there as quickly as possible, right? And so that helped me understand, look, um, I believed in meritocracy. I still think meritocracy is good, but it's not sufficient. Um, I realized just working hard, just telling little black kids in the inner city to work hard doesn't always amount to the same outcomes. And there are some big systemic realities that lead to that. But even as a black woman today, I didn't quite realize that until I was in it, until I saw it. So there's a whole lot more. I mean, yeah, there's a whole lot more behind this. But interestingly, again, you're, you know, the question of how has being a black woman in white spaces impacted you? It's like, well, I get it. I, I can agree with many people that I don't see a lot of overt racism anymore, conscious acts of prejudice, but man, do we still have problems? And we can all play a role in fixing them. But I mean, what you just described is overt racism. Of course. It's overt systemic racism. And, you know, sometimes a lot of us don't see it, don't even have any idea it's there. And sometimes we see it and we ignore it. And, you know, I guess all I can say is thank goodness some of this is coming to light and people are paying more attention to it, at least my perception in a small way. There are some people that are reacting against it more. Than had been the case, but oh gosh, oh yeah, in the last few years, the the backlash has been so disappointing. <clears throat> but <laughs> I try to focus on the bright spots and where yeah, we have I hear you. Growth. I hear you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, lots we can say about this, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let's let's just keep going. Um, so, you know, you've talked about kind of like anti-racism in a Christian environment. Um, mm-hmm. How do you differentiate that versus, you know, the anti-racism uh, work that's done outside of the Christian environment? So good. So good. So um, first of all, let me say, I do believe there is a lot of common ground. And first of all, let me say what I mean by anti-racism, because people have different impressions of what that's about. Um, anti-racism, as I see it, essentially is about moving from passive to proactive in our posture toward racism. That to me is the heart of it. Instead of just saying, well, um, I, I'll be uh, part of the solution by just being nice to people, you know, or, or just not being racist. I'm not just not going to be racist. Um, that has shown itself to be incredibly ineffective when it comes to the bigger picture of systemic racial inequities. And so um, what we need is to say, not just, well, I'm not going to, I'm just going to stand back and be nice, but um, no, I'm going to actively be part of the solution in terms of uprooting racial disparities, right? And, um, you know, I like to say to people, okay, uh, if you think about, say, an an antihistamine, right? If you have an allergy, it's one thing to say, well, I'll just have some soup. Um, to help me feel better, but I'd like the soup and an antihistamine to to directly take, you know, that allergy out of the picture or antiperspirant. Okay. You can, (laughs) you can wear some perfume. That's great. But antiperspirant really gets at the root of the problem. Those are great analogies. I've never heard those before. Thank (laughs) you. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah, they're in the book. Antihistamine and antiperspirant. There's more where that came from. Sure, (laughs) sure. Those are great, though. I love it. Thank you. But yeah, I just, you know, um, like I said, the the, the backlash we've experienced and some people trying to make anti-racism the bad word, it's ridiculous because, you know, we use it in other ways and it's very helpful. In any case, um, so so anti-racism, I just see it as essentially you're saying, no, no, I, we need to directly do something to uproot racial inequity. We can't just sit back. Okay. So then, you know, how does a Christian approach to anti-racism differ, perhaps in some ways from a mainstream approach or mainstream culture approach of the world? First, I just got to say, there's definitely a lot we, we have in common, 
And so I see that Christians can have plenty of common cause with justice causes in the world. God is a God of justice. I believe that there is common grace that many people um, that God has created can see where things are going wrong and how to fix them. And so there is a lot of common ground. And I think, you know, even just what I, that definition that I just gave, I think we can agree on, okay, we probably need to move from passive to proactive. We have some common ground there. Um, but then in terms of a Christian approach to anti-racism, what is that about? And for me, um, look, at the simplest level, the key difference is Jesus. Key difference is Jesus. And here's what I mean by that. Um, ultimately, you know, ultimately, in the end, we want to be about obeying Jesus. We want to be about doing what Jesus did like he did it. So we see that in his ministry, he was constantly uplifting the marginalized. He was constantly lifting up ethnic minority people as models and heroes, very, very counterculturally in his day. Um, we do these things ultimately because Jesus did, and it's part of his kingdom and his character, okay? And we want people to meet him ultimately. Again, right? So there's plenty that I think, you know, we, we can have common cause and just making life better in general. Yes. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what we say, we believe as Christians is that Jesus, Jesus is the one who's going to bring perfect justice, perfect beloved community. And he desires to connect with each person now um, and bring them abundant life now. And so um, in that way, I take common cause with the civil rights movement of the 60s, which in large part was driven by the black church and I would say a Christian approach to anti-racism, a Christian motivation for that work. Um, yeah, the other thing I would say, so Jesus, his greatest command was love. Greatest command. It all came down to that, right? He's like, if you can just, just sum it up, all the law, all the prophets, everything, Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. And so um, that's where we get to this concept of beloved community. And also where I believe that um, Martin Luther King, toward the end of his life, was talking more and more about beloved community. And his life ended before he could really expand upon it. Uh, but here's one of my most favorite quotes of Martin Luther King. He said, I do not think of political power as an end. Neither do I think of economic power as an end. He, these are ingredients in the objective that we seek in life. And the end of that objective is a truly brotherly society, the creation of beloved community, right? Um, a Christ-like love where we actually sacrifice, and look out for each other. Um, so like I said, his, his life was cut off before we had the chance to really develop that. But um, it is love of God, love of neighbor, grounded in Christ, as the sort of ultimate motivation and end goal that makes us different. Well, 50 years later, we're still not there or not even close. Right. I mean, unfortunately um, there's still so much work to be done, <clears throat> but um, you know, I have to ask you, even though you're in the midst of a three book launch, <laughs> yes. 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 Are there any future projects book projects oh that you've thought about that you're able to talk about at this point. If not, that's okay. But I just have to ask. Um, nothing. I don't have any concrete kind of ideas. I will say in terms of what, where my mind goes when I think about that question, I um, probably one of the things that I most enjoyed about this project is bringing a strong discipleship Christ-centered lens into a very challenging topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I see other potential areas where that could be the case, right? So if I had to guess, I would say that probably the next thing I do, again, this is like a 50-50 maybe, it depends, but probably the next thing I do wouldn't necessarily have to do with race in particular, um, because my actual real interest is discipleship and seeing, you know, how can we what does it mean to be disciples in the various aspects of life that are challenging to us right now? Right. So I don't have any shortage of potential areas oh, that yes. are challenging, right. For us right now. At Very all. true. Very true. So there's that the other thing I would say is that, as I mentioned earlier, I was not exaggerating when I said I had the most fun writing the children's book. 
So I could definitely see, um, uh, yeah, uh, another few kind of children related projects in the foreseeable future. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. Well, good for you. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to hearing about those. Uh, so as I mentioned, the titles of the three books are Color Courageous Discipleship, Color Courageous Discipleship Student Edition, and the picture book, God's Beloved Community. So Michelle, again, congratulations on um, this threesome. And uh, Thank I really you. wish you the best of luck of that and the rest of your work. And um, you can learn more and keep track of all of Michelle's work at michelletsanchez.com. Thank, Thank you, you so us, much. Michelle. Thank you so much. I had a blast. <laughs>